Jetzt freue ich mich, endlich Ursula Hughes für den Auftaktvortrag vorstellen zu dürfen. Ursula ist Leiterin des Sozial- und Wirtschaftsforschungsinstituts Analytica in London und lehrt dort auch an der London Metropolitan University. Sie gehört, so kann man sagen, zu den Pionierinnen, was die Forschung ähm, zu den Auswirkungen der Informations- und Kommunikationstechnologien auf die Arbeitsverhältnisse angeht. Schon 1980, so habe ich ihre Homepage entnommen, hat sie einen Aufsatz publiziert zu den Auswirkungen neuer Technologien auf die Beschäftigung von Frauen in West Yorkshire. Und im Jahr 2003 kam ihr Buch raus, was vielleicht einige von euch kennen, die Produktion eines Kybertariats, die Wirklichkeit virtueller Arbeit. Ursula hat zu den verschiedensten Aspekten der Umstrukturierung der Arbeitsmärkte geforscht, zu den Auswirkungen des technologischen Wandels, Telearbeit, Globalisierung, Chancengleichheit, soziale Sicherungssysteme. Sie hat auch eine ganze Menge Bücher, Artikel und Forschungsberichte verfasst. Sie wird jetzt zur Einführung in diese Tagung einen kritischen Blick auf die sogenannte globale Wissensökonomie werfen und wir werden im Anschluss eine kurze, leider nur kurze Gelegenheit haben, Rückfragen zu stellen und Ursula dann nochmal das Wort geben. Okay, vielen Dank erstmal. Ich übergebe das Wort an Ursula. Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction and for inviting me here. And apologies for having to address you in this global language of English, which I have to tell you is not my mother tongue. I'm Welsh. I come from the, the first colony. Um, but um, anyway, thank you for your patience in uh, listening to me uh, in this language aided by these great translators here. Um, the topic I was asked to speak about here was the global knowledge economy. And the very phrase global knowledge economy uh, summons up an image of some kind of autonomous sphere of uh, knowledge-based economic activity or virtue, which is kind of virtual or cyber or weightless or whatever. There's been a huge literature on this idea of a knowledge economy, something that's somehow separated from the kind of the old smokestack industries of the 19th century and the production industries. And I think it's very important to remind ourselves that it's a material world, that Uh, basic human needs, you know, for food, for shelter, for warmth, etc., are still, as they always have been, met by physical means. We're sitting on chairs, we're wearing clothes, we eat food, we're, our lives are absolutely necessarily sustained by the extremely physical material things which are brought to us through a division of labor that involves people using their bodies, you know, <laughs> in physical ways. Um, human beings extract and harvest the planet's natural resources. They manipulate them, they recombine them, they distribute them, they consume them, they dispose of the waste. And this is the basic stuff of life. This is still how we live. Um, over the centuries, or the millennia even, social systems have developed complex divisions of labor, usually based in very strongly gendered divisions of labor. Um, uh, and many of these divisions of labor involving hierarchical forms of control, but they are very various uh, in different societies. Uh, under capitalism, changes in this division of labor have been highly dynamic. Um, a continuous, uh, although albeit very uneven, but a continuous process of destruction and recomposition at the level of, of sectors, of organizations, of labor processes, at the level of skills, um, a constant reconstitution, sometimes violent, violently affected, a constant restructuring of the division of labor, driven, of course, by the imperative of maximizing the extraction of value. Um, in this process, increasingly, so what you might call mental activities are separated from manual activities. But this does not mean that the mental activities are autonomous. Absolutely not. There is a, 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 a very strong interdependence between the mental activities and the manual activities. Um, and 
the mental activities are very largely driven by uh, the, the, what, what they're linked to in the division of labor is this physical production of physical goods and the delivery of physical services to real people in real time and real space. And this, I think we should, we forget at our, at our peril. Um, sorry, right. So the new global division of labor um, to just step back a little bit, I think we have to think about how we model this new global division of labour. And the most common metaphors that are used for this in the literature, people talk about global value chains, which is a kind of rather vertical kind of uh, metaphor, or in the French tradition they talk about filière, um, which is a more kind of idea of flows and process, or they talk about networks. Um, but it seems to me that the, you know, the underlying concepts are, are very old and quite simple to understand. Um, the first of these, con they all go back to the 18th century uh, in theory. The first concept is the division of labor, um, uh, you know, developed originally by Adam Smith in the literature, but of course elaborated by many others since, including Karl Marx. The labor theory of value, which also goes back to Adam Smith, uh, but was greatly developed by Karl Marx. And the theory of comparative advantage, which we find in Smith, Ricardo, etc. I'm sure I don't need to spell these out to such an audience, but it seems to me that these three theories give us the building blocks of any modern theory that we need to understand the, um, the global division of labor. If you put them together, you have a model of a value chain or whatever you want to call it, of network filière, in which businesses are broken down into separate trades, branches, and functions. The more specialist the division of labor, the more value is added in each operation. The comparative advantages of regions make it profitable to introduce a spatial dimension to this division of labor, but this may be constrained by limits to the free operation of markets, to movements of capital, and of course, uh, resistance by workers. And um, uh, you know, there are, there are various things which constrain uh, the, the, this, this, the free movements of capital. Um, but the, the logic of comparative advantage underlies these decisions. And that in order for the value to be extracted from this division of labor, you need some form of centralized governance of the chain or, or the... And this, you could say, is, is a model of a global value chain. 